Love's Last Words. It's the title of our Easter, our Lenten series this year. It's a deep dive into the final statements that Jesus made while on the cross. Approximately 9 a.m. in the morning, Jesus was nailed to a cross. It was placed upright and sank down into a deep hole. And over the next three hours, Jesus says his first three statements from the cross. And then we know at noon, darkness came over the land. And the, the curtain in the temple tore in two from top to bottom. And then over the next approximately six hours, Jesus hung there and he said the final four statements from the cross. The last one being, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. My phrase that we're going to look at today is the third in that sequence of seven statements. And in this case, it's actually a very brief conversation or exchange between Jesus and his mother, Mary, who was at the foot of the cross. The Son of God, naked, beaten and bloodied, hanging between two criminals on the cross. And over his head hung a sign that said, King of the Jews. Right? It's, it's his crime. Um, the claim was that, that uh, he was Lord. But he wasn't a savior or a king to come and conquer and rule. He, he was a savior to come and sacrifice and give his life as a ransom for us. Those gathered, the text tells us, at the cross were insulting him. It says a soldier um, that had been trained in torture takes a sponge and dips it into sour wine, which would be actually like vinegar, and jams it into the busted, busted up, beaten face of Jesus. And he says, if you're the king, come on down and save yourself. And right in that moment, Jesus makes his first statement. And get this, with that going on, all the mocking and all the insulting, he looks up and he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Then there's this conversation between Jesus and the criminals at either side, right? One of them hears this and he joins in on the insulting of Christ. Are you the Christ? Well, then save yourself. And why don't you save us too? And the other criminal on the other side, now this conversation is going back and forth, rebukes him, almost yells across Jesus to him and says, you know, paraphrase, shut up, right? You fool. Don't mock God. We're up here because we deserve it. But this is an innocent man. And then he turns to Jesus and, and he says to him, remember me. When you come into your kingdom. And then Jesus' second phrase, he first looked up, and now he looks to the side. And he speaks to this criminal and says, truly, I say to you, today you will be in paradise. And then the third phrase, the one that we'll look at today. Below Jesus is his mother Mary. She's present right there at the base of the cross. The Gospel of John records in John 19, 23, it says this, When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic, it was seamless, a woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, hey, let's not tear this, but let's cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. And just pause here. Mary's watching all this go down. Think back for a moment with me. You've got you to put yourself here. Well, while Mary was pregnant with Jesus, she wrote the Magnificat, right, found in Luke 1. She says she's overcome with joy, pregnant with, with Jesus, and she cries out, My soul, it magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices God, my Savior, for he's looked upon the humble estate of his servant. Mary's cousin, Elizabeth, in a loud cry, says, Blessed are you among women. Jesus grew up the perfect child. So you might expect parenting him would have been effortless, right? However, I think the pressures and the anxiety of being Jesus' mother would have been crushing. Because Mary was visited by an angel and she knew who this baby was that she carried. And right away, just eight days after the birth of Jesus, we're told that Mary and Joseph take the baby Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem to have him dedicated. And this man, this prophet, this Simeon comes along. 
And he lays this incredible prophecy, this foreshadowing on top of Mary and Joseph. In Luke 2, it's recorded. Behold, this child right here is appointed for the fall and the rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And then get this, he's looking at Mary now. And a sword will pierce through your soul also so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Mary, he's basically saying, pain is coming your way. Twelve years later, Mary and Joseph and their entire family, they travel to Jerusalem to take part in the Passover feast. And now they're heading back to Nazareth, their hometown. They get about a day's worth of, of a walk away from Jerusalem, and they realize Jesus isn't with them. You might think, well, how could they do that? Well, I mean, this is a large group of people traveling back to their hometown of Nazareth. He's probably off playing with the other 12-year-olds, they think. But when they get about a day's worth away, they realize he isn't there. They rush back to Jerusalem to find him, and they, they, they do. And, and it says this, when they find him in the temple in Jerusalem, Mary goes up to Jesus and says, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching in great distress. Do you get that? extremely worried, a lot of anxious on Mary's part. And Jesus says, that, why were you looking for me? Did you not know I must be in my father's house? And this little text, it closes by saying, and his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And I don't think this was that warm, sweet treasuring. I believe that what she's saying, that fearful, afraid, what does this mean type of treasuring? We don't know this for sure. But early on in Jesus' ministry, he's back in his hometown of Nazareth preaching at the local church there. You have to figure that Mary would have been there, right? Guest preacher in town at the local church, her son, my guess, she would come. I mean, if I'm preaching in Munhall, some, you know, my mom's probably going to come over and see the hometown boy, right? So Mary's probably there. You know, I'd go as far as say most likely she's there. And if you know this text, Jesus preaches about the Messiah to come. And it says he preaches about it and then he rolls up the scroll and he hands it back to the, the attendant and he says, Today, that prophecy about the Messiah, it's been fulfilled. Standing right here in front of you. Basically, Jesus says, I'm the Messiah. And, if you, and again, if you know this text, the place goes mad. Man, it says that they rush Jesus that they charge him out of the temple, take him to a cliff, and are about to throw him off. Mary most likely witnessed all that. What would it have been like for her to live there in that town, knowing that they had so decisively rejected her son right from the beginning? So you can see this joy of the mother, but also this incredible weight and anxiety of being Jesus' mother. As a young virgin, right, receiving this news of being pregnant with the Holy Spirit. Man, just think about that. Through, through the stress of, of raising Jesus, this wedding at Cana, Mary's pregnant when Jesus, I mean, Mary's present when Jesus turns the water into wine. At this wedding, she was there through some of these incredible brief moments of Jesus' ministry where healings and incredible teachings take place. She's there when they're yelling, crucify him. And it brings her now to the foot of the cross. And in John 19, 25, it says this, But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Can I just set the picture for you here? And I sort of talked to Jim Platt about this a little bit. These crosses would have been fairly close to one another. When it says Mary is at the foot of the cross, folks, she, she's, she's not 30 or 40 yards back there, somewhere out in the crowd. She's right there. He's on the cross. She's not over in front of the other, the criminal. She, she's right there. She, she's watching this all go down right at the foot of the cross. And with the exception of John, all the disciples have left Jesus. John is there now with four women. Mary, Jesus' mother, Mary's sister, another Mary that we don't know, just says the wife of Clopas, and then Mary Magdalene. And Jesus' mother is near this cross watching all this mocking and hatred transpire. No doubt she's probably weeping uncontrollably. She's looking at her son. This is her baby boy that she kissed that little forehead. 
now has a crown of thorns jammed into it. Those are the little hands that she held. Now has a, a spike driven through it. Her soul is indeed being pierced, just like Simeon had, had prophesied what was going to happen. Jesus only spoke three sentences in those first three hours, so there's a lot of time for silence, a lot of time watching her son suffer. Jesus first looked up to God and then to his side, spoke to the criminals, and now he looks down and he sees Mary, broken, vulnerable, crushed, helpless, most likely sobbing, saying, my son, my son, as they are throwing dice right in front of her for a seamless robe that most likely she made for him. And then comes this third statement from Christ. It's a tender statement. In verse nine, chapter 19, verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, that's John, standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. So what's Jesus saying here? In Mary's most vulnerable moment, Jesus is saying, from here on out, Mary, he here's your son. And John, from here on out, here's your mother. To Mary, what he's basically saying is, I'm no longer your son. Right now, in this moment, I'm your savior, right? No longer think of me as son. John is now son. From this day forward, I am your Lord. See, in his life, Jesus did a lot of looking up to pray to God. He looked to the side and he talked to his friends and his enemies face to face, eyeball to eyeball. But he always had time to look down and see the vulnerable that were around him. When a man with a disgusting disease of leprosy dro was dropped to his knees in front of Jesus begging for a healing, Jesus didn't walk around him. And he said, can you make me clean? Jesus said, yeah, yeah, I can. I, I can make you clean. When these friends of a paralyzed man dug a hole in a roof where Jesus was speaking and dropped this man on a mat right in front of him, Jesus didn't continue with his sermon. He told the, the guy, hey man, your sins are forgiven. Looking down at pick that mat up, go on home. When the rich young ruler, you know, whose daughter was back at home dying, throws himself at Jesus' feet amongst a gigantic crowd of people, all pushing their way in, and tells him, please, please come with me. My daughter is dying. Jesus does say, man, I got a lot of stuff going on here right now and keep on moving. He looks at him. He looks at Hey, don't be afraid. Come on, just, just believe. Let's go. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 7, it records this time that Jesus is having dinner at a Pharisee's house. The, the name of this Pharisee was, was Simon. He's a religious leader. Uh, he's a morally outspoken person. And, and the text says this. Behold, a woman, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he, Jesus, was reclining at the table of the fairy's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. So in the middle of a dinner, basically, party, it says a woman of the city enters, right? And a woman of the city does not mean that she has like a loft in Lawrenceville, right? This is a, this is a prostitute is what this means, Right? And, and, and get this, she, she just opens the door and walks in. Because if she would have knocked, they wouldn't have let her in. She just opens the door and, and walks in. And she enters this morally elite man's house and makes a beeline to Jesus, falls at his feet, and begins to sob. You know, she's a prostitute. L little girls don't dream of becoming prostitutes, right? I have two little girls. They're not so little anymore, but two daughters. And, and they never grew up, you know, desiring to be used and abused by sad men. This woman 
walks into this room feeling unlovable, feeling shame, drops at her feet and begins to weep. And then the text goes on to say this. It says that Simon, so the Pharisee, he saw this and it says he thought to himself. And here's what's recorded. If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this was that was touching him. For she's a sinner. He's just thinking this, right? And then, I love this next text, this next line. It says, and Jesus answering him. Okay, like he didn't say anything. Jesus knew what he was thinking and answers him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he goes on and he tells his story, basically putting Simon in his place. And then down in verse 44, he says, then turning toward the woman who's at his feet, again, he looks down, he sees this woman. I know for whatever reason, I think he probably picks up her chin. And it says, he says, he speaks this to Simon, though. So he's looking at this woman, down, vulnerable, crushed, unlovable, shame, picks her chin up, and then he says, he says this to, to, to Simon. Do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she's wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. hair. You can read the rest of that story. Um, Jesus basically looks down and sees this incredibly vulnerable woman and you know, a, a woman that's probably has not had a whole lot of eye contact w- with men who's been used and abused and viewed as a product her whole life And Jesus does not look at her as a consumable, but rather he sees her in the image of God. He commends her faith. He forgives her sins. In this moment of divine, divine, almost scandalous faith, Jesus wrings from her the guilt and shame, and he sends her away in peace. Whether a rich synagogue ruler whose daughter is dying paralytic, a leper, his mother at the cross, or a prostitute, Jesus continually looks down and he sees the vulnerable. And I'm playing my cards for the rest of this sermon right here. Do we? In our lives, do we take the time to look down and see those that are vulnerable all around us? You know, at Northway, our mission effort is called Um, transformational outreach. And our mission effort is is focused on who we consider some of the most vulnerable um, folks that there are. That's the orphaned, abandoned, and at-risk children. It's how we filter and focus our resource to our mission partnerships. At at Northway, it sits under this sort of large umbrella, which I mentioned we call transformational outreach. And just just to pause there for a second, we we call it that because if you look down and you serve the vulnerable, there is a transformation that happens. So so hopefully you help or serve someone that's vulnerable, but there's a transformation that happens. It's not all just about what happens to the person you're helping. There's something that happens deep inside your soul and your heart. That's why we call it transformational outreach. It's it's a a two-way street. And under the transformational outreach umbrella sits ministries like our orphan care ministry. And I just want to read this. This is right off our website. This is what our orphan care ministry stands for. We as a church are called by God to defend the cause of the fatherless. Our purpose is to raise awareness of the 147 million orphaned and abandoned children in our world and then educate and equip people with the resources and support they need to care for these at-risk children. Orphan care helps people that are interested in adopting or fostering. It supports families that have adopted or are fostering. It provides financial resources and education for those that are considering adoption. And it mobilizes our members to go on mission trips and to visit a lot of the orphanages that we support. Also under this umbrella, ministries like our justice team, which educates and advocates on behalf of some of the most vulnerable people in the areas of human trafficking. Guys, you got, you got to get a hold of this. Slave trafficking is happening right here in Pittsburgh. And we have a team that is in the trenches. Our LAMP ministry, right, is mentoring extremely vulnerable boys and girls in Homewood. We, we have a ministry that we partner with, you might even be aware of this, called Safe Families. It steps into families, and particularly kids, that are at a very at-risk or vulnerable time. When parents 
have a situation that they need to deal with. Maybe it's a legal situation or a rehab situation. And they need some place to, to put their kids temporarily, sometimes for a few days, sometimes for a week or so. Save families in Northway. We can participate in this. The kids could come and be with us, be cared for, be loved on, while the parents take care of whatever it is that they need to take care of. It's an amazing ministry. We have local Northway partners here from House of Man, A Light of Life, Pittsburgh Kids Foundation, Urban Impact, Young Life, Open Hand Ministries, and local food banks, just to name a few. In fact, there's information in your lobby today. It gives you information about all of those and many more. But I want to talk about one of our other ministries at Northway, but a heads up here. Just giving you a heads up, I'm about to fly into some what some believe to be very controversial, maybe even political airspace. And I, I, no doubt all of us would agree that this is delicate and a sensitive subject. So, so please stick with me. And I just want to pause and say something. I, I preached this sermon last week, and, and right after my next sentence, someone got up and walked out. Didn't get to hear the rest of what I wanted to say. W would... Would you please hang in there with me? And if you have an issue with anything that I'm going to say, contact me, talk to me afterwards. But hear, hear it all. So, so I believe that, that the most vulnerable lives, more vulnerable than abandoned children, fatherless or orphans, um, is that of the unborn. And we have a ministry at Northway that's called Embrace Life. And it steps into that very dark space and it advocates for the nearly one million Boys and girls that are aborted every year in this country. Don't check out on me, please. Biblically, I believe that life begins in the womb at conception. God knit us together in our mother's womb. And that the spiritual soul is present. And that all human life is made in the image of God. Please do not perceive this as me trying to make a political point in this sermon. I get asked all the time, well, what party, Scott, do you belong to? I am part of the kingdom of God party. I've already got my guy. I've watched the debates, and I'm confident that none of those men or women are my savior. My hope does not rest in America becoming great again. I love, I love, please hear me on this, though. I love this country. But, folks, we are not the hope of the world. Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. I just want to make it clear, I don't have a political agenda here at all. This brief point in this sermon is simply to raise awareness for what I believe to be the most vulnerable, and my ultimate hope is Jesus would heal. Jesus would step into whatever's going on in all of our hearts and heads right now and heal. Christians standing on street corners in front of hospitals or abortion clinics with vulgar picket signs and screaming hateful things at young girls or young couples on their way in, I believe has set the defense of the unborn back. Instead, surprisingly, what I think has come to the defense of the unborn is this, science. L let me sort of set my Bible over here for, for just a second. In 1970, we did not have 3D MRI images of an eight-week-old sucking its thumb in its mother's womb. What we know now, we did not even know through science 20 years ago that at eight weeks, a baby has brain waves. They dream. They feel pain. All of their organs are functioning and they have their own fingerprint at eight weeks, right? That is all known through the advances in science. Science is carrying the day on this issue. So based on science and on my, on my Bible, I do not want to lack the courage to tell you that they are the most vulnerable and helpless life in American society. I can't be a coward and not tell you that I believe at some point our children's children are going to wonder what in the world we were doing, killing a million babies a year. I think very much in the same way that generations after slavery was repealed look back to their grandparents and great-grandparents and says, what were you thinking? Folks, this is not political to me. It's science and it's biblical. But let's be really clear about something here. We are talking about human beings, but not just the baby. I am talking to you about the woman who finds herself pregnant. 
Jesus has not just called ourselves to moral principles and arguments. I can have a moral position, but for every one of those babies represented, there are real women in real situations, some of them seemingly hopeless and some carrying an immense amount of pressure and guilt and shame. Can you get your skin right into just a minute? Can you get into the skin of, say, a young girl that's been unloved, that, that has never, you know, been given a, a vision for her future, that has no role model talking to her about college. She doesn't have the capacity to look into the future and see good days ahead, and then she finds out that she's pregnant. There's a quote from a, from a sociologist that says, among the urban poor, sex is a playground for men and a nightmare for women. We need to be serious about the unborn. But we also got to be serious about that girl, about that young gal too. For, for a young 19-year-old sophomore, maybe going to school at Pitt that goes out one night and has way too much to drink and doesn't even remember the night and then wakes up and finds herself to be pregnant. She's overwhelmed with guilt and shame or if her parents find out, she knows they're gonna stop paying for her college. She feels sick, she feels lost, she feels ashamed. We need to be serious about her too, right? We, we need to enter into their sorrow because they are vulnerable also and be the presence of Christ. And let's be serious about babies, but let's not demonize these young women. Hear me, embrace life ministries comes alongside women who find themselves in unwanted pregnancies and helps them during the pregnancy, after the birth, or after the abortion. And they deeply care for them. And maybe that's a place that you need to engage in and serve. Caring for the vulnerable begins with looking down and first seeing them and then entering into their sorrow and be the presence of Christ. Folks, throughout the Bible, I can't give, find any time where Jesus gives a moral lecture to a vulnerable person. Instead, he continually lifts up their head, he looks in the eye, and he speaks peace and grace. Northway provides dozens of opportunities for us all to look down, find the vulnerable, and enter into their sorrow with them. Jesus calls us into action he puts the vulnerable on our minds and in our hearts. You know that's true. Because here's why. My guess is somewhere over these last 15 minutes that I've been talking, a vulnerable person or situation has come to your mind. You've thought about that mission trip that you always wished or, or wanted to take. You've thought about possibly mentoring or adopting or fostering or volunteering at Light of Life. You've thought about something right now. Maybe, well, you, maybe you just thought about the person, the elderly person that lives across the street that you know is lonely. Maybe you've just thought right now about your niece or nephew who, who, whose dad just left the house. And, and they're hurting and they're reeling. You've thought about somebody that was vulnerable. God does that to us and he calls us and challenges us to act on that. And then why don't we? So let me give you three reasons why I think that sometimes we don't act. Here they are. One is this fear. Folks, one of the storylines that's been hammered that I think needs to be hammered out of American Christianity is that first and foremost, it's, it's supposed to be safe. In American Christianity, first and foremost, we need to hammer out this sort of perception that God wants it all to be safe because he doesn't. Jesus guarantees our security. Regardless of what happens in your life, you are secure in Christ. God's care for you is security. You know, your, your eternity is secure in Christ. When you believe God's perfect plan for your life though, is to be safe, to, to memorize some, some scriptures, you know, to, to be morally upright, to sit on the couch and read another Christian book and only listen to Caleb and, and try not to do bad things, that, that's a sad version of the Christian life. Engaging with the vulnerable can be scary and messy and it certainly pushes us out of a comfortable zone. Being a Christian, it does not mean not being bad. 
first of all, that's not biblical. And second of all, that sounds terribly boring to me. God's perfect love can cast out all fear. Embrace life, for example, can help you advocate for the unborn. Orphan care will help you with the adoption process. The justice team will prepare you to care for those coming out of human trafficking. And I can't guarantee you safety or fairy tale endings. Folks, God has not told you to be safe. He has said, I am with you, let's go. The second reason I think sometimes where we don't lean into the vulnerable is this challenging word, self-righteousness. I think this is when we don't seek to serve the vulnerable because maybe we think they deserve the mess that they're in. I mean, I've worked hard for, for what I have. Why didn't they? She shouldn't have had sex. You know, that single mom shouldn't have had another kid. You know, he shouldn't have put himself to be in a place to be in jail. He shouldn't have been doing those drugs. I mean, maybe he had this coming. That's self-righteousness. You know, even on the cross, Jesus gave little thought to himself and his own needs. And he directed his care to the least of these. Third, a little bit more complicated, I think it's there's this erosion of the human capacity towards empathy and compassion. We're overwhelmed with the distractions and it causes us sometimes just not to feel at a deep level, right? We have so much news coming at us about the evils and dangers and the tragedies in our cities and our nation and our world that sometimes we just get overwhelmed by us and we convince ourselves that the situation, it's unsolvable or it's, it's so complex that therefore like we just don't even allow it to, to, to have any empathy towards us. We just sort of set it o over there. We say to ourselves, like, well, 147 million orphans. What am I supposed to do with that? Million uh, abortions. There's 50 kids on a waiting list in Homewood for, for a mentor. These slums in India, you know, the poverty in Haiti. And we just, we just simply check out of it. Can I remind you that Jesus wants us to mourn with those who mourn, to grieve with those who grieve. He wants us to feel the weight of the brokenness that's around us and then lean into it and help shape it for him. God calls us not to a moral position. He calls us to hold moral positions, but then to step in to more than that. He calls us not to be driven by field, fear over, or owned by self-righteousness or, or allow sort of empathy to, to erode away. We've been created to be in the muck, in the mire, folks. It is there where we will find out how powerful he is and who we are in him. If you step into this, I want to tell you a couple of things right up front. There will be more lows than highs. You, you, you will have your heart broken. You will cry. But it will be incredible. It will be incredible. As Christ did on the cross and throughout his ministry, he saw the vulnerable. He met them with compassion. We have been called to look down and find the vulnerable, lift their heads up and speak grace and peace and hope to them. I mean, do you think I'm looking forward to continuing to preach this sermon week after week at each campus? This is a challenging message. And if I made you uncomfortable, I'd like to say I'm sorry, but I'm not. This is not an intellectual discussion. It's a deeply spiritual and emotional matter. My prayer is simply this, that God would reveal an area of vulnerability in and around you and that you would then step forward and engage in it. I want you to stand up with me right now. I'm going to have your campus leader step up and pray for you and I'm going to Pray for those here.